Good afternoon. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Samuel Gregg. Dr. Gregg is the Director of Research here at the Acton Institute. Um, <clears throat> he has a MA in philosophy, political philosophy from the University of Melbourne and a Doctor of Philosophy degree in moral philosophy from the University of Oxford where he attended as a Commonwealth Scholar and studied under the very distinguished Professor John Finnis. About one half to 60 percent of the books on the back table were written by Sam Gregg. He usually writes about one book a week. <laughs> we have weekly staff meetings and we, everybody has to say what's going on. He says, well, we wrote another book this week and so and if he doesn't write them, he edits them. So basically, that's the Sam Gregg table back there. Um, he's written several um, books called, uh, one of them, Economic Thinking for the Theologically Minded, um, Ordered Liberty, and The Commercial Society, uh, which he's just came out in 2007. He's working on a new book on the economist Wilhelm Repke, and he also uh, has a forthcoming book on uh, papal thought, and also the thought, including the thought of Pope Benedict XVI. Uh, he's written in numerous uh, journals and uh, newspapers, the Wall Street Journal Europe, the Washington Times, et cetera, and et cetera. Um, <clears throat> Sam is one of the clearest thinkers that I've ever met. He has insightful analysis on economics, history, philosophy, and theology. It's always a joy to listen to him speak about something, so I think you're going to enjoy him uh, and his lecture today. This is, um, is it hot up here? This is a big day for Sam because this is the first lecture that you're ever going to hit here. This is actually not a big day for Sam. This is a big day for you because this is the first lecture that you're going to hear Dr. Samuel Gray give as a citizen of the United States of America. <laughs> So Sam just became a citizen. He's now a citizen of the world, okay? Because he is now, he's not only Tasmanian, but he's also Australian and American. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Samuel Gregg. He's going to talk about the economy and on balance what's happening here in this very volatile and um, exciting period in the economy. Dr. Samuel Gregg. <clears throat> well, thank you, Michael. Thank you. It's good to be here today, and it's good to be talking about a subject that I suspect is on many people's minds right now. Uh, I have to confess that when I proposed doing this lecture on this topic a couple of months ago to my colleagues, uh, I had no idea I'd be delivering it uh, after the past week on the financial markets. So you probably won't be surprised to know that I've been revising this lecture day by day uh, as uh, the week has worn on. Because as many of you know, on Monday, the US stock market suffered its worst daily plunge since the 2001 terrorist attacks. But it was back in August 2007 uh, that many people in the United States who were by no means economists became aware that things weren't quite right with our economy. They began to hear the expression credit crunch enter everyday discussion. They began to notice that the value of their house was dropping. They began to hear that friends and neighbours who hitherto appeared to have lived very comfortable lives suddenly had their house foreclosed. The word inflation began to appear in newspapers with disturbing regularity and of course in the same newspapers they read that things weren't quite good at a number of important Wall Street financial houses. And as time wore on, <clears throat> as credit became tighter, as house values went from dropping to plummeting, as more people began wondering if they could make their next mortgage payment, as unemployment started to go up, as the price of many household items started to rise, as more people became aware that a number of respected financial houses, such as Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, were teetering on the edge of bankruptcy, 
more and more people began to ask the question, what's wrong with our economy? Now, <clears throat> the flippant, but perhaps a little chilling initial answer to that question is, where do I even begin? Because it's true that over the past year, the United States has at no point formally entered a recession. That's classically defined as two quarters of negative growth. So far, there's not even been one quarter of negative GDP growth, and the last quarter was actually a very respectable 3.3%. But just to refresh our minds that there are some problems with our economy, here's some very basic indicators. First of all, during 2007, nearly 1.3 million American housing properties were subject to foreclosure. That's up 79% from 2006. Major banks around the world report losses at the moment related to housing of approximately half a trillion dollars, and some predict that the toll is going to rise to about one trillion. Second, the S&P index of national house prices is down 16% from its peak. Now, judging by the number of unsold homes, I think it's got a lot further to fall, and most economists think that house prices have to fall another 15% in order to get back to reality. Third, as I suspect many of you know, inflation is now 5.5%. Fourth, between 1992 and 1990, the economy added 22 million new private sector jobs. Over the last eight years, only 5 million new private sector jobs have been added to the economy. Fifth, unemployment is now 6.1%. Goldman Sachs is predicting that unemployment will reach about 6.5% by the end of next year. Now this translates effectively into several hundred thousand more Americans out of work. Sixth, there's signs of deep economic anxiety among Americans. Now this is a very highly subjective exercise, but I think you have to be worried when something like 80% of Americans say it's now harder to maintain a middle-class lifestyle than when it was five years ago. Seventh, <clears throat> and this is especially worrying, even though it hasn't been talked about very much, in June this year, the IMF informed the Federal Reserve Chairman, Ben Bernanke, that it was going to engage in a general examination of the US financial system. This has never happened before in American history. Now, I could go on and on and on and on, but none of these are good signs. So today in our short time together, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to outline what I think are the three main problems characterizing the economy. And I say three main problems because I think that despite all the turmoil over the past week, the three fundamental problems haven't changed. The second thing I'm going to do is talk a little bit about what might be some ways forward. <clears throat> but just three caveats before I begin. First of all, <clears throat> don't use anything I say today as a basis for your investment decisions. Don't do that. <clears throat> Secondly, I'm going to dispense with technical economic jargon, partly because I think it's confusing to many people, but also because I think much economic language tends to obscure the fact that economics is really about human choice, human action, and human institutions. So I'm going to try and keep this simple. The third caveat <clears throat> is that this is a big subject, and I can't and won't try to cover everything. It's vast, I think, because many of the origins of our economic problems go back to Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal. It's also a vast subject because the American economy is the world's biggest economy. So for all these reasons, I'm going to keep this lecture at the level of generalities. But I want you to understand one thing, and that is this, that this is not just an economic issue. One of my underlying themes is that many of America's economic problems today also reflect, to a certain extent, moral problems. Moral problems of hubris, of lack of transparency, and of conflicts of interests. Now, these moral issues, I think, are quite central to these economic issues because, well, I'll, I'll discuss why later, but I think they've received very little attention because I think we tend to treat economic phenomena as if it's completely separate 
from the moral life, when in fact I think the two things are intimately connected together. So <clears throat> let's start talking about the three main causes, I think, of America's, America's present economic problems. Well, first and foremost, I think we have to understand that America is experiencing a downswing of the business cycle. Now, there's many economic theories about business cycles, but they essentially involve shifts over time between periods of relatively rapid growth and periods of relative stagnation and decline. Recovery and prosperity in the business cycle is associated with increases in productivity, growing consumer confidence, high demand, and increasing prices. Periods of contraction reflect a purging of unsuccessful enterprises as resources are transferred by market forces from less productive uses to more productive uses. In other words, economic downturns, such as the one we're going through, partly reflect the market's natural mechanism of undoing the misallocation of resources that goes on during the periods of economic booms. A good example of this is the dot-com investment frenzy of the late 1990s. This was a classic case of artificially abundant credit subsidizing unsustainable overinvestment, and eventually the market corrected, corrected the situation in the form of the dot-com crash. I think the current housing market downturn reflects a similar model. Too much easy credit subsidizing unsustainable price increases created a housing bubble. Eventually, the bubble burst. Credit dried up, prices began falling, and foreclosures started accelerating. So to a certain extent, we simply have to wait for the dust to clear. Much of the current credit crisis, I think, won't come to an end until the current surplus of newly built houses is liquidated and home price deflation comes to an end. Now, speaking of credit, <clears throat> this brings me to the second big problem characterizing the American economy, and that, of course, is the credit crunch. Now, this is an expression which we hear a great deal about, but let me briefly explain what the credit crunch is and some of its implications. I think most people understand that the credit crunch has something to do with the collapse of the subprime mortgage market. Now, in the United States, subprime mortgage lending refers specifically to loans that don't meet Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae guidelines, as if they are a really good guide these days. <clears throat> Now, they don't meet these guidelines <clears throat> because of factors like the credit status of the borrower, or rather the lack of it. Now, this doesn't just apply to housing. It also manifests itself in things like car loans and credit cards. Now, I want you to keep in mind that there's nothing morally or economically problematic about subprime lending per se. Yes, predatory lending does occur, but it tends to be the exception rather than the rule. Indeed, we have to remember that subprime loans, be it in the form of credit cards, car loans, business loans, or mortgages, actually gives many people access to credit that they wouldn't otherwise have. The real problem with the subprime mortgage market was that lots of subprime debts were repackaged by banks and built into attractive looking but immensely complicated investment securities. These were then snapped up by banks and hedge funds and tra traders all across the world. So what does this mean? Well, it means that when the subprime mortgage industry collapsed because of unsustainable price rises and debt levels, those people who had bought these immensely complicated subprime-based securities suddenly found it impossible to accurately value their investments. So what happens when you can't accurately value an asset? You have uncertainty. And uncertainty means that people start reducing their debt. Banks start restricting their lending to each other and to businesses and to individuals. And this produces great difficulties in maintaining credit lines. As a result, ordinary, healthy businesses across the world with no direct connection whatsoever to the US subprime industry, suddenly started facing difficulties because many banks were unwilling to extend credit. 
the flow of funds between bank banks also began to dry up, <clears throat> leaving many investment banks effectively stranded with mountains of bad debt they can't pay for and for which there are no buyers. By the way, I think hedge funds could be the next problem area precisely because many of them have relied on borrowed money to amplify their returns. Now, <clears throat> you might say, isn't this why we have securities rating agencies? Isn't it their job to basically assess the risks involved with different securities and provide a rating? Shouldn't they have stressed the risks of basing so many securities on the subprime mortgage market? Well, the answer to all those questions is obviously yes. Assessing risk is one of the most essential and profitable activities of securities rating agencies. But here I think we see a clear example of moral failure. Many security ratings agencies failed to identify the growth of defaults as an emerging problem in the subprime mortgage market. Why? Because I think many of them were acquiescing in conflict of interest scenarios. Years ago, many banks and hedge funds, knowing that ratings help to secure and determine the value of securities, many of these banks and hedge funds began approaching ratings agencies to ask their advice on how to structure securities in order to maximize their value. Now, at this point, the moral antenna of ratings agencies should have begun quivering. Why? Well, because it's very difficult to provide objective assessments of risks associated with different securities when you have helped structure the very same security. Now, this, however, did not deter some ratings agencies from involving themselves in structuring securities. So, it's no wonder that when the subprime mortgage market started melting, on which many of these securities were based, many ratings agencies were very slow to concede that something was wrong. Because this would have raised big questions about their objectivity, the very questions that are being asked now. Now, I'm not suggesting that ratings agencies were somehow involved in a type of sordid financial swindle. My point is this, that when ratings agencies were asked by banks and hedge funds to become involved in structuring securities, they should have said no. That would compromise our capacity to objectively assess the risks associated with your securities. Our objectivity is our greatest asset. It can lend value to your assets, but only if our assessments remain objective and detached. Now, I think that some ratings agencies' failure to do so reflects a major moral failure of judgment on their part. Of course, failure of judgment hasn't just been characteristic of securities agencies. There's been some major failures on the part of America's monetary system, which is the third of the big three problems. I think it was Lenin who said that the best way to destroy capitalism is to de destroy the currency. Well, we're not quite in that situation, but there's no question, I think, that our monetary system has let us down. There's little doubt, for example, that the Federal Reserve contributed to the bubble in house, house prices by lowering interest rates much lo earlier in this decade and keeping them low. Now, when the Fed lowered interest rates back in uh, 2000, 2001, they were doing so primarily because they wanted to diminish the impact of the collapse of the dot-com bubble. So between 2000 and 2003, the Federal Reserve lowered the federal funds rate target from 6.5% to 1%. Now, it believed that interest rates could be safely lowered because they thought that the inflation danger was low. The problem, however, as we've discovered, is that the Federal Reserve's inflation figures were deeply flawed. It's often said that a good central banker should know to keep questioning the data, because then you force the economists to keep verifying it. But because they did not, because the Fed kept interest rates so low, it allowed a flood of easy money, a flood of credit to enter the market, much of which went into the housing boom. 
Now, I think it's amusing that in recent months, some economists have been half-jokingly saying that the present crisis raises questions about whether, when it comes to monetary policy, America would be better off going back to the gold standard. Now, note that I said half-jokingly, because whatever you think of the gold standard, and it has plenty of critics, it does seem to subject the money supply to stricter market disciplines than government officials. Now, <clears throat> there are lots of other problems with the American economy that I could mention. These include things like the excessive debt levels of individuals and governments in the United States. I could talk about the ups and downs of the dollar. I could talk about the failure of certain parts of the economy to adapt to change, et cetera, et cetera. But I wanted to focus on what I'm calling the big three problems, because I think you can see that they're all related to each other. And having outlined these three basic problems, I now want to look a little bit forward to see what might be happening. So when it comes to the way forward, I think the first point to note is that there is no magic bullet that's going to solve this problem. There's no instant solution. Whatever the politicians say, there is no instant solution to this problem. And any attempt, I think, to find and implement one is bound to be counterproductive. It's also true, I think, that many of the longer-term solutions are, frankly, moral in nature. We need to remind people that they have to avoid conflict of interest situations, such as we found in the securities rating agency industry. We also need to remind people of the folly of hubris. Investment bankers and financial analysts, for example, should admit that there comes a point when the structure of an investment security is so complex that they cannot possibly understand it. And this being the case, they should be reluctant to buy it, let alone recommend it to other people. We also, I think, need to remind people of the economic importance of basic honesty. It was recently reported that something like 70% of early subprime defaulters made fraudulent rep representations on their loan applications. In other words, 70% of people asking for a subprime loan lied. Lied about their credit status, lied about their assets, etc., etc. And we're still seeing the economic implications of that lying today. But beyond this, I just want to make three specific points about the way forward. <clears throat> First, and this goes completely contrary to what you're hearing on the television right now. The first is a plea that we do not give in to the temptation for more regulation. The last time America experienced great problems in an industry, the corporate scandals I'm thinking of 2000, 2001, we ended up with the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Now, this has proved to be extremely costly for business, not least because the sheer size of Sarbanes-Oxley makes attempting to comply with its requirements almost impossible. Even some of the authors of Sarbanes-Oxley now concede that its provisions were very badly drafted. The second recommendation, <clears throat> second plea, is that we do not give in to the temptation to continually use the state to prop up businesses and industries. As you know, the Federal Reserve has already indirectly bailed out one financial house, Bear Stearns, and it's now taken an 80% holding in AIG. In other words, it nationalized. It nationalized what the biggest insurance company in the United States. The biggest insurance company in the United States is now the American government. <clears throat> now, until recently, the argument for these steps was never stated publicly, but it was stated just over a week ago by Secretary of the Treasury Henry Paulson when he talked about the government's nationalization, because that's what it is, of Fannie and Freddie. He said, some businesses are considered too big and too important to the economy, that they are indeed too big and too important to be allowed to fail. I've never heard an American government official actually say that, but Paulson said that 10 days ago. But what I want you to note is that this has not resolved the problem. By preventing, for example, Fannie and Freddie's imminent demise, the Bush administration has certainly taken a major negative financial element off the table. 
It may not, I have to say, I must say, it may not have had much choice. But we're only beginning to discover now just how bad things were at Fannie and Freddie, a problem which, by the way, includes substantial misreporting of accounts. <clears throat> in the end, I think, this particular intervention is not going to work unless the Bush administration and whoever wins in November 2008 has the courage to take the government out of the housing market and does not set up any more public-private entities like Fannie and Freddie that not only fundamentally distort the housing market, but also aggressively lobby Congress to ensure their privileged status. <clears throat> now, I understand the argument for limiting market contagion. I understand that the risk in allowing a major bank to fail is that other institutions will be dragged down with it. And I do think that there are a very limited, very limited number of instances when I think a case can be made for government acting to contain failure. But there's one major problem with all this, and that's this problem of moral hazard. Moral hazard. If you consistently protect people or institutions from the effects of their mistakes, they are not going to change their behaviour. Businesses in that regard are no different from small children or teenagers. One of the interesting side effects, <clears throat> one of the interesting side effects of the government's refusal to bail out Lehman Brothers was that Merrill Lynch felt compelled to sell itself to the Bank of America. In other words, believing that there would be no more bailouts, Merrill Lynch let itself to be sold to a private bidder instead of asking for a taxpayer-funded bailout. <clears throat> In other words, the market solved that particular problem. Now, the same problem, I think, applies when it comes to the federal government bailing out businesses in the form of direct government payouts or loans to private companies that are no longer viable. As most people, I think, here know, the three big automobile companies are right now in Washington, D.C., busy lobbying Congress for a $25 billion payout. Now, ironically, one of the justifications they're using is that they're saying that only such a loan can allow the big three car companies to meet federally imposed fuel efficiency targets. In other words, the imposition of a government regulation is now being used as a basis to plea for a government, or more accurately, taxpayer injection of funds. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, where does it stop? Where do you draw a line in the sand? When do you say no? If mortgage companies, insurance firms, large financial houses and car companies are being bailed out by the federal government, why in principle should not every other business that's in difficulty demand the same treatment. Because I think if free markets are going to be allowed to create wealth, then we have to accept that unsuccessful businesses need to be allowed to fail, just as allowing successful businesses need to be allowed to flourish. Yes, I understand that allowing businesses to fail is difficult. It brings a lot of pain with it. I don't for a moment want to downplay that factor. But propping up failed industries has its own set of injustices, especially for taxpayers. And secondly, I think in the long run, it tends to lead for protracted economic pain and progressively worsening, worsening losses for society, worsening moral losses, social losses, and economic losses. <clears throat> now thirdly, my third thought about the way forward, <clears throat> and this is perhaps the most controversial. We need to allow market corrections to take their course. Now, of course, no politician can say that, but I can. I want to acknowledge, of course, that the economic and social costs of economic slowdowns and contractions can be very painful. There's unemployment, wages go down often, profits go down, and of course, there are bankruptcies. These things are not to be dismissed lightly. And I myself don't have much patience with people who try to reduce people's lives to mathematical formulae. 
But I also think, <clears throat> and this is controversial, that there are some benefits to economic contractions. It's arguable, for example, that economic slowdowns or even recessions are a necessary feature of economic growth. The economist Joseph Schumpeter argued, for example, that economic slowdowns can be part of the process of creative destruction, whereby inefficient, technologically redundant, uncompetitive, or just simply complacent businesses are weeded out and capital is released for new industries. Another benefit, if you want to call it that, of an economic slowdown is that it purges the excesses of the previous boom, leaving the economy in a healthier state. So for example, I think that the Fed's massive easing on interest rates after the collapse of the dot-com bubble delayed this cleaning process. And it simply replaced one bubble, the dot-com bubble, with another bubble called the housing bubble. <clears throat> but here's the problem. Delaying the correction of past excesses by pumping in more money is only going to make the inevitable future economic market corrections much more painful and much more difficult. I don't think Keynesians have ever accepted this basic point. Put another way, and this is controversial too, perhaps the policy dilemma facing the federal government and the Fed is not so much, should not be one of a choice between recession or no recession. Maybe the choice should be between a mild recession now or a much more difficult and painful recession in the near future. Now, <clears throat> this doesn't mean, I think, that we should always follow the advice of Andrew Mellon. He was the Treasury Secretary during the period of the 1929 crash. In response to this, he said, liquidate labor, liquidate stocks, liquidate the farmers, and liquidate real estate. It will purge the rottenness out of the system. Now, I think there is a case to be made for central banks acting to stop a recession from turning into a deep depression. But I also think that it's wrong to try and stop recessions altogether. <clears throat> so, to conclude, and this is a long conclusion. If this has proved to be a somewhat depressing lecture, I'm, I apologize. Uh, but to cheer you up, I thought I'd ask you to keep the following facts in mind. Facts about the American economy, which I think should actually give you tremendous grounds for optimism. And the facts are these. The United States remains by far the world's biggest economy. It's three times the size of its nearest rival, which is not, by the way, China or India, it's actually Germany and Japan. America is also the world's biggest economy by purchasing power. It's the world's fourth most economically free country. It has the high, tenth highest GDP per head in the world. It's the second biggest exporter in the world. It's the third biggest trader of goods. It's the second biggest trader of services. It has the world's largest manufacturing output. It is the world's largest service provider. It's number one when it comes to global competitiveness. It has the world's sixth most favorable business environment. It's ranked number one in the world for creativity and innovation. It is the world's sixth highest spender on research and development. It had the second highest number of patents issued in 2008. It's the second highest place in the world for foreign direct investment. Seven of the world's 10 biggest companies are American. America still has the largest market capitalization in the world. It also has the biggest number of internet hosts in the world. And last of all, it also has by far the biggest number of Nobel Prize winners in the world. Now, all this remains the case, despite the current difficulties. And by the way, export growth from the United States is surging at the moment, and productivity is generally up across the economy. I also think that we need to put our economic problems at the moment 
into a type of historical perspective. I think Americans today have grown used to extraordinary prosperity. Poor Americans today are far more likely to own fridges, dishwashers, and air conditioners than middle class Americans in 1971. Younger people today have no memory of a serious recession because the last one was in the early 1990s. Some people don't even realize that cyclical downturns are normal in an economy. <clears throat> Today's unemployment rate is 6.1%. In the Great Depression, it peaked at about 24%. Now, the job losses, which at the moment are running at about 65,000 a month for this year, they don't even begin to approach the magnitude of those that were seen in past economic downturns particularly the recessions at the beginning of the 1980s, when the economy shed something like 140,000 jobs a month and employment was up over 10%. So <clears throat> I think that's all good news and should make all of us feel very confident that in the long term, things will get better. But there are, I think, two potential problems that could delay this process of recovery. The first is the strong likelihood that all the temptations that I mentioned before will in fact prove irresistible, especially in an election cycle. That regulation will increase, that more bailouts will occur, and governments will try once again to prop up industries that simply need to be subject to market disciplines to prove their worth or otherwise. The second big potential obstacle, I think, to sustained recovery <clears throat> is the American banking system. If the credit crunch proves to be protracted, and I think we're maybe, maybe 50% of the way through, maybe, if the credit crunch proves to be protracted, there's a possibility that the American economy could enter a period of stagnation. Now, I think many of you here will remember the Japanese economy which once seemed invincible to so many people at the beginning of the 1990s, slid into stagnation by the mid-1990s. Now, Japan did undergo monetary, fiscal, and regulatory reform, but it also failed to clean up its banking system. Japanese banks dealt with their liquidity crisis by hiding their bad loans, by lobbying politicians to turn a blind eye, and they stopped lending money to profitable businesses. The result was a decade of average Japanese growth of less than 1%. Now, <clears throat> most of the people, I think, dismiss the idea that America could suffer the same fate as Japan. America, it's argued, has a far more transparent financial structure which prods banks into recognizing losses and addressing their difficulties. American Treasury officials, for example, have taken a far tougher line in getting Fannie and Freddie to own up to their problems than Japan's finance ministry did with Japanese banks in the 1990s. Just as Ben Bernanke, I think, seems very intent on not repeating the Depression-era mistakes made by the Federal Reserve, Treasury Secretary Paulson, I think, seems determined not to repeat Japan's mistakes in dealing with their credit and banking problems in the 1990s. The problem, however, is this. The problem is that credit is the grease for the economic wheel. When bank credit starts to freeze up, as it has done in America, so does the rest of the economy. Why? Well, it's because credit is not just about money and capital. Credit is also about trust. It's interesting that the word credit is derived from credere, credere, which is the Latin word for to believe, or but also to trust. So whether it's giving someone a credit card for the first time, or extending a small business the capital that it needs to grow from a small business into a great enterprise, Providing people with credit means that you trust them enough and that you believe in them enough to take a risk on their insight, their reliability, 
their honesty, their prudence, their thrift, their courage, and their enterprise. In other words, the moral habits without which wealth creation can't occur. Today, I think we're often told that the market economy is, simple, is essentially and simply materialistic. We're told that it's simply about the buying and selling of things, and some people even tell us that it's a distraction from the higher things, including the moral life. But a moment's thought, I think, about credit, <clears throat> and here's where I'm concluding, a moment's thought about credit reminds us just how much market capitalism actually depends deeply upon a web of moral qualities. Once these moral qualities are corrupted, be it by basic dishonesty or the bad incentives that are created by excessive regulation, then I think the market economy's engine of credit and its fuel of trust begins to dry up. And when that happens, as we're seeing in America's economy today, the wheels of wealth creation begin to splutter and they eventually grind to a halt. People lose their jobs, businesses die, and families start to suffer. I don't think there is any greater demonstration that you cannot have free markets without morality. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.